the Christian writers and a lot of times the secular writers were actually they were fair. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so it, it's kind of some of the information is a little we won't go super long with this because I'm going to pick it back up again in a few weeks here with you. And there's a lot to talk about this. We are going to go through uh, a lot of quotes from David Benedict's book. Uh, if you don't have this one, The History of the Donatist by David Benedict. I read this years ago, and then I I think I reread it again, but I can't remember how far I read, but I, I, I think I did, but I don't remember. So anyway, um, but this one is from Baptist Standard Bear, and I would suggest if you like Baptist history at all, and you, the reason why I want to go through a lot of this book, though, is because on ancient Baptists, we rarely have this much content. And the reason we rarely have this much content is because they got all their books got burned. Okay, so in different groups, the Donatists, which was right after the Novationists, overlapped the Novationists. The Donatists would be that group that you will find. They were okay. Basically, the Donatists were called the Schismatics. We were Baptists are always known as the Great Schismatics. <laughs> That's just who we are. We're the ones that. When we're there, if there's a problem, we're a part of it somewhere. We just, that's the way it is. If they're, right? Am I right? There's something, if there's a problem, right, Brother Jake? If there's a problem in history, the Baptists are somewhere in there, and they, they have a problem with something. They just can't conform. They're the what? The non-conformist. That's who they are. They just won't, they won't conform. But a sword. Yeah, that's. They're just nonconformists. They're just stubborn. They won't, they won't do that, right? So there was a problem there. So you're going to hear, this is from Schaff's history, Schaff's history here. Then we have Benedict. There's going to be others that I'm going to talk about. Really, we're just going to kind of lay out some things today from a few different perspectives. We're not going to get deeply into, uh, you know, all of it, but you have to understand what happened. So I'll give you a background of that kind of of what took place, but just know that we're always the troublemakers. And if you go back in the scriptures, remember what Elijah, what happened with Elijah, uh, what he said, art thou he that troubleth Israel? Remember that one? Remember what he said to him? Art thou he that troubleth Israel? That's you. You're the one, right? They said to Elijah, you're the one troubling Israel. Ahab said to him. And, and uh, Elijah said, I haven't troubled Israel. But you and your father's house have. Right? He gave it back to him, didn't he? Anyway, so uh, with the Donatists, this, so this, uh, Schaff calls his history, calls it the Donatist schism. That's what he calls it. Because it was. It was a schism that arose up. But you got to understand, there's like a lot of players in the game here that's going on. You've got the Roman Catholic hierarchy that's rising. You've got Constantine that comes in around 303 or whatever it was, 80, Constantine comes in and he sees it's politically expedient to grab a hold of Christianity, make it a state religion, and make everybody uniformed underneath it. And with this sign, conquer, and we talked about him, which we'll get back to him, and his, and his councils and everything. And, and then so you have a problem that arose. Then you have the fact that nobody's getting, no, less people are being murdered. The, uh, for the Christian faith, so the martyrdom is slowed down. If you'll notice, right when we did, when we just talked about the fourth century, we didn't have as many martyrs. I had twice as much in the century before. Right up coming to the fourth century, there was a lot, and then it tapered off with Constantine because Satan changed his tactics. He used flattery and subtlety and peace, right? And that was the merging of that state church. Well, there was, there's always a remnant. There's always a remnant of people that rise up that just can't conform. Right? They just refuse to follow those things. They refuse to go with the flow. They go against the grain. They're schismatics. They're troublemakers. And that would be the Baptists. That would be that group. And this would be the Donatists. They would be that group. They caused the schism. So, you know, I was in listening to that song that we just sang, right? 
you listen to those words, that man knew a little bit about nonconformity, right? He understood that. Now, he wasn't of our stripe, that man wasn't, but these men were the Donatists. And I feel like we need more to, to learn more about these people than we do about Constantine or anybody else, right? Why? Because these are the Baptists, and this is Baptist history. <laughs> so we should take our time and learn about these Baptists, this ancient group, and find out, well, what did people say about them? You know, and what you're going to what you're going to find is a lot of similar things that they say about you. Right. A lot of similar things. I believe that if the Donatists were let's let's make it let's put it into modern perspective and put a practical application. If the Donatists were alive right now, that group, if we were if they were here in this time and the state came to them and they said, well, OK, we have these PPP loans. Stay closed. We'll fund your buildings. We'll do all this stuff for you. We'll. Just obey and follow us. They would have been the people that said, no, I don't think so. No, I, I don't think so. Isn't it quite scary that there's not really that many people in America, not that many independent fundamental Baptist churches that said no? Most of them that had Christian schools and everything else, they couldn't get in line fast enough to get that money. They just couldn't, right? They couldn't. These Donatists, they would have been like, no, I don't think so. No, we don't want that, right? But there was a reason for it because they understood that that all kind of comes with a price. So we'll read first from Schaff, which is was a reformed, I guess you could call them kind of Reformed Catholic, I guess you could call them. That's what I call them. That's, that's, that's kind of what they are. But anyway, especially this guy. But anyway, he does write some great history, though. He does give some great history that you wouldn't find if he didn't gather a lot of that stuff. We would have a hard time finding it. But you can always see kind of the spin on different things that will come. Gib Gibbon is the same way. Gibbon was not a Christian. He was a, a secularist, but he wrote a lot of good stuff. Like uh, the history of Rome, the Roman Empire. Where's that, over here? Somewhere. Anyway, somewhere. The history of the Roman Empire, the, which Gibbon wrote. And he, he, yeah. So anyway, so there's a lot of facts there. Donatism was by far the most important schism in the church of the period before us. For a whole century, it divided the North African churches into two hostile camps. Like the schisms of the former period, it arose from the conflict of the more rigid and the more indulgent theories of discipline in reference to the restoration of the lapsed. So what happened was, remember we talked about the traditors, remember those guys? That they were traitors, they gave over the scriptures, they gave over their brethren, they, they, they turned on the gospel, and the do, remember the novationists said, well, you can't come back. They took a rigid stance. I mean, if you watch people get killed and murdered that you loved because these people turned, you wouldn't trust those people either, right? You'd be like, but you gave up. I mean, you turned them in. You, you, gave, ev you gave everybody over. They just couldn't handle that. They said no. They, they just couldn't. Remember, I'll tell you one thing right now. Those Baptist churches back then, those church, they had discipline. Right? They, they did. So anyway, so that's what was going on right there at that time. But through the in intervention of the Christianized state, okay, all right, class. Now, what does he mean by the Christianized state? What is he talking about? Constantine, that's right. He's talking about the fact that Rome was being Christianized. See, this is a, this is a time pivotal in Baptist history it, it, that you have to understand because so many things were happening so fast. You know how that is, right? When things happen so fast around you and all this stuff is going on, you're like, whoa, what is happening here? Well, that's what was happening in the world. It's kind of like, you can liken it sort of to COVID, but more like 9-11. When 9-11 hit and they, boom, they just started moving stuff right away. That's what was happening all over the empire at that time. But through the intervention of the Christianized state, it assumed at the, it assumed at the same time an ecclesiastical political character. The rigoristic penitential discipline had been represented in the previous period, especially by the Montanists and the Novatians, who were still living, 
while the milder principles and practice had found its most powerful support in the Roman church. Well, go figure. And since the time of Constantine had generally prevailed. So the Catholics were generally. Now, why is, is that a surprise that, that, that the Catholics would prevail? Well, no. It's the path of least resistance. And if, if things are going easy, if things are going easier, hey, you can still you can still go to church and you can still do those things. Just obey us and follow us. Right. So that path of least resistance is the path that most people take. And that's the path that they would take. The beginnings of the Donatist schism appear in the Diocletian persecution, which revived that controversy concerning church discipline and martyrdom. The rigoristic party favored by Secondus of Tixus, at that time primate of Numidia, that led by the bishop Donatus, rushed to the martyr's crown with fanatical contempt of death. Now, let me, let me just say, this is what the Reformed Catholic is saying. So they, they would have you to believe that those, that those Donatists were just, they were just insane. They just could taste death, and they just ran to it. They just wanted to die. Do you really believe that? Nah. Do I believe there was some of that, that they weren't afraid to die, and they were going to stand up for their faith? Yeah. But I also don't believe that they were completely careless. But if you're writing from a Catholic reform, a reform perspective, what are you going to say? Right? And by the way, also let me say this to you. What did the martyrs of those people say to them when they stood up there, or what did the the uh, the state? What did they say? They accused them of the same thing. Well, you just you're just fanatical. You just don't care if you die. They had with with a fanatical contempt of death and saw in flight from danger or in the delivering of, up of the sacred books. See, here's what they said. Here's what the Baptist said. Here's what the Donatist said. And they saw in flight from danger or in the delivering of the of, of the sacred books only cowardice and treachery, which should forever exclude from fellowship of the church. So they, they, they had a rigid discipline. They were like, you know what, if you give up the scriptures, if you give up your brothers, if you turn them in, if you do that, I mean, you, you're not coming back. Like, we just think it's cowardice, and we're not going to take you back. It's just the way they were. It's the way they said it. The moderate party, at whose head stood the bishop, Mensurus and his archdeacon and successor, Cecilian, advocated the claims of prudence and discretion and cast suspicion on the motives of the forward confessors and martyrs. So he made everybody, the confessors and the martyrs, he made them think that there was something, you know, made people think there was something wrong with those people. Well, there was. They, they, they weren't going to give up the Bible. So I, I can imagine that if somebody came to your house and they said, well, we're going to shoot you unless you give all your Bibles up and you give them all to us right now. So, yeah, you would, wouldn't you look at them if they didn't give the Bible, if you were somebody and you would say, oh, they're a bunch of fanatics. Right? That's the way they viewed them. You know the way the Donatists viewed it? Being obedient. Preserving the scriptures, following the Lord, protecting their brethren. Right? That's how they viewed it. But that's not how they were viewed. So early as the as year 305, a schism was imminent in the matter of an episcopal election of the city of Sita. But no formal outbreak occurred until after the secession of the persecution in 311. And then the difficulty arose in connection with the hasty election of Sicilian to the bishopric of, bishopric of Carthage. The Donatists refused to acknowledge him. He said, nope, we don't recognize him. Because in his ordination, the Numidian bishops were slighted and the service was performed by the bishop Felix of Aptungus, or Aptunga, whom they declared to be a traitor. That is, one who had delivered up the sacred writings to the heathen persecutors. So you mean their Bibles actually meant something to them? They actually, they actually cared about them? So they, yeah, they did. 
In Carthage itself, he had many opponents, among whom were the elders of the congregation, and particularly a wealthy and superstitious widow named Lucilla, who was accustomed to kiss certain relics before her daily communion and seemed to prefer them to the spiritual power of the sacrament. Which I find funny, because the Donatists didn't even, they, they didn't, they would never have agreed to any of that, what was just said. But this is a Reformed writer that's writing about them. <laughs> a, a, a Catholic Reformed writer that's writing about them. So he's basically saying, oh, it's all, you know, trying to make it look like the, uh, the Roman group was the right group. And the Donatists were just, they were just a bunch of schismatic troublemakers. Right? And they were kissing statues and all kinds of stuff. Secondus of Tiscus and 70 Numidian bishops, mostly of the rigoristic school, assembled at Carthage, deposed and excommunicated Sicilian who refused to appear and elected the lector Majornius, a favorite of Lucilia, in his place. After his death in 315, Majornus was succeeded by Donatus, or Donatus, however you want to say his name, a gifted man of fiery energy and eloquence. So he was a preacher. That's what they mean by that when they say that. He didn't actually bore people to death, but people actually listened to him. A man of fiery energy and eloquence, revered by his admirers as a wonder worker and styled the great. From this man and not from the Don from Donatus mentioned above, the name of the party was derived. Each party endeavored to gain churches abroad to its side, and thus the schism spread. The Donatist appealed to the Emperor Constantine. The first instance of such appeal and a step which they afterward had to repent. Oops. Why? Because they never should have appealed to him. They didn't need to. They didn't need to appeal to him. The emperor, who was at the time in Gaul, referred the matter to the Roman bishop Melodes and five Gal Galatian bishops before whom the accused Sicilian and ten African bishops from each side were directed to appear. The decision went in favor of Sicilian, and he was now, except in Africa, universally regarded as legitimate bishop of Carthage. The Donatists remonstrated. A second investigation, which Constantine entrusted to the Council of Aralet in 314, led to the, uh, the same result. When the Donatists hereupon appealed from this ecclesiastical tribunal to the judge of the emperor himself, he likewise declared against them in Milan in 316, and soon afterward issued penal laws against them threatening them with b the banishment of their bishops and the confiscation of their churches. Wait, no, not the grand, good, and wonderful Poobah Constantine. He was a great Christian man. He would never do that. Well, he did it. Threatening them with banishment. Persecution made them enemies of the state whose help they had invoked. Guess they shouldn't have asked him for any help. They learned, though, and fed the flame of their fanaticism. <laughs> you love that? Hey, I don't have a problem with that charge. You can call us fanatics for Christ if you want to. If they can be fans of football teams, if they can be fans of death, if they can be fans of wickedness, if they can be fans of, that's what fan means, right? A fanatic. Are we ashamed to be that of Christ and of the scriptures and to follow them? Amen. Amen. The persecution made them enemies of the state whose help they had invoked and fed the flame of their fanaticism. They made violent resistance to the imperial commissioner, Eurasicus, and declared that no power on earth could induce them to hold church fellowship with the rascal. <laughs> Constantine perceived the, fruitful, the fruitlessness of the forcible restriction of religion. And by an edict in 321, granted the Donatists full liberty of faith and worship. Oh, thank you. 
He remained faithful to this policy of toleration. No, it isn't. And exhorted the Catholics to patience and indulgence. At the Council in 330, the Donatists numbered 270 bishops. Constance, the successor of Constantine, resorted again to violent measures, but neither threats nor promises made any impression on the party. It came to blood. S the Circumcilians, a sort of Donatist mendicant monks who wandered about the country among the cottages of the peasantry, carried on plunder, arson, and murder in conjunction with the mutinous peasants and slaves, and in a crazy zeal for the martyr's crown as genuine soldiers of Christ, rushed into fire and water and threw themselves down from rocks. Yet there were Donatists who disapproved this revolutionary frenzy. This, the insurrection was suppressed by military force. The, uh, several leaders of the Donatists were executed. Others were banished, and their churches were closed or confiscated. Yeah, it is. Donatus the Great died in exile. He was succeeded by one Parmenius. Parmenianus. Unli under Julian the Apostate, the Donatus again obtained with all their her with all other heretics and schismatics freedom of religion and returned to the possession of their churches, which they painted anew to redeem them from the profanation by the Catholics. But under the subsequent emperors, their condition grew worse. Both from qu the quarrel between the two parties extended into all the affairs of daily life. The Donatus Bishop of the Bishop Faustinus of Hippo, for example, allowing none of the members of his church to break bread for the Catholic inhabitants. Well, good. And then comes in Augustine, and we'll talk about him later, Augustine, and the Donatists, their persecution and extinction. At the end of the 4th century, in the beginning of the 5th, the great Augustine of Hippo, where was also a strong congregation of the schismatics, made a powerful effort by instruction and persuasion to reconcile the Donatists with the Catholic Church. So he wanted to drop some of that Christian democracy on them. That's what he wanted to do, just like any, any good, mean heretic would want to. Right? He wrote several works on the subject and set the whole African church in motion against them. What a nice man. They feared his superior dialectics and avoided him wherever they could. Something tells me I don't believe that. The matter, however, was brought by order of the emperor in 411 to a three-day arbitration at Carthage, attended by 286 Catholic bishops and 279 Donatists. Augustine, who in who in two beautiful sermons before the beginning of the disputation, <laughs> exhorted to love. Oh, nice guy. To love, forbearance, and meekness. Was the chief speaker on the part of the Catholics, Petillion on the part of the schismatics. Wait till we get to, and we don't have time today, but wait till you get to their writings. Petillion and those other men in here, I have their writings against those men and what they said to the Catholics. Unbelievable. We will not get to it today, but we will get to it in a few weeks. And what they said about those Catholics and what they were doing, they, they nailed them. Okay. Marcel Marcellinus, the imperial tribune and notary, and a friend of Augustine, presided. Oh, wasn't that nice? And was to pass the decisive judgment. <laughs> he would be very partial since he was really good friends with him. This arrangement was obviously partial. There he goes. <laughs> okay, good. And, sec and, and secured the triumph of the Catholics. The discussions related to two points. One, whether the Catholic bishops of Sicilia and Felix of Ab Abtunga were tra traitors. Whether the, church, whether the church lose her nature and attributes by fellowship with heinous sinners. The balance of skill and argument was on the side of Augustine though the Donatists brought much that was forcible against compulsion religion and against the confusion of the temporal and spiritual powers. So what were they doing? The Donatists were what? They were fighting against the, the, the churches, the temporal and spiritual powers combined. So the Donatists were speaking on religious liberty. That you should not enforce people to believe by the sword. That's what they were doing. That was the force of the Donatist argument. 
What was the force, force of the Catholic argument? We all should just get along, and you should just listen to us, and you should just come in, and you should just, you know, see, what do they do? They shade it with love. What do they do? What do they do now all over the place? You see all these Bible verses out there. Well, they're not really Bible verses, but love, love your neighbor. Love. Put your mask on and love everybody. Yeah, you got to love. You got to love your neighbor. Wear a mask. Don't go see grandma, because if you really love grandma, is grandma's grandma's apple pie worth dying for? Yeah. Have you ever tasted grandma's apple pie? Right. You don't love. That's what your problem is. That's the same thing Augustine did. He put this flowery speech out there of love. And what do these guys look like? Oh, they're just a bunch of rough, rugged schismatics that walk in the door, right? There must be knuckle draggers. They just run in, and what do they do? They're preaching about religious liberty and separation. And you're going to hear in their words about separation of the powers and all those other things. I mean, you're going to hear in those words what they said. I'm telling you. I'm not ashamed to claim those people as Baptists. I'm telling you what. I'm just, I, I, the things that they said to the Catholics and exposed that they were doing is unbelievable. And, and see, you have to understand something. What are the Donatists? What is the, okay, what's the difference today in the Reformed churches and, and, and mixed with those in the Catholic churches as opposed to Bible-believing Baptist churches? What's, what doctrine differentiates them from all others? Baptism, number one, but, what's, but church, the doctrine of the church. When you had America, what made America extremely weak and tepid and bad when, before the Great Awakening? That the churches had the halfway covenant and they were filled with lost people. So what did the Donatists say? Just like what Baptists say. No, the churches, well, a lot of Baptists don't say it today. But they should be saying it. That the church is supposed to be filled with the saved. And there's supposed to be separation, discipline. There's supposed to be, there's supposed to be an order that's followed. All those things. They were contending for church purity. What if Baptists always contended for when they knew when they knew it was right to do church purity you can't say that today for most baptist churches because most of them have no clue why they're a baptist my old pastor i said to him i i i, I wanted to i you know before we were separated i wanted to have a i had ted alexander come in here and teach baptist history and he was like well i'm just trying to get people to be fundamentalists i'm just trying to get to, get them to be fundamentalists Really? Yeah, it did come from Hiles Anderson because that's where he came from. That's exactly what that doctrine is. I just wanted to be fundamentalist. Well, maybe if you show, but I hate to break it, maybe if you showed them the roots of where things come from and they understand that, and they're not detached from their history, maybe they'll actually, under, maybe I would rather be a Baptist than a fundamentalist in that sense. Because if I'm a Baptist, then I already believe the fundamentals of the faith, but I go farther and believe the rest of the book. Look, if this, let me tell you something, right? I'm going to be real with you here a second, and I want to tell you this. If your Christianity is only a uniform that you put on Sunday and you take off every other day of the week, then just quit faking. But if it's your life, if it's who you are, if your life is in Christ, then that's who you are then it won't matter what that title is, per se, in that sense. But these people, what they're, what they're trying to, that's why the churches are so weak today. They don't even know who's on their roles. They don't know who they have. They don't know if they're going to even show up. If you don't show up, I'm going to find out why. I usually don't have to because you usually call me and tell me. But I shouldn't have to wonder why you're not here. Should I? Should I have to sit around and wonder that? 
My goodness, but look at this. That's the difference. You see the difference? These Donatists were like, no way. We're not doing that. They traded the scriptures. They traded everything else. We don't recognize them at all. We don't want anything to do with them. So they asked the question whether the church loses her nature and attributes by fellowship with heinous sinners. Well, of course she does. She defiles it, her church. And that's why discipline is so important. And I understand what these guys were doing because of, I, I've had things happen because of that. I know what it's like to bear that reproach when the church stands up and does right. I know what that's like, and so do you. You've been a part of it. You understand what it's like to have to discipline somebody out. You understand what it's like to deal with those things. That's what they were contending for. That's their contention. The balance of skill and argument was on the side of Augustine, though the Donatists brought much that was forcible against compulsion and religion and against the confusion of the temporal and spiritual powers. The imperial commissioner, as might be expected, decided in favor of the Catholics. So basically, every time the Donatists went to a court like that, they lost. Guess why? Because we don't care what they think. That's why. We don't, I, I'm not looking for the state to, just like somebody asked me, uh, because I didn't want to, my, my sending church asked me, you don't want to be 501c3? Well, you don't want to be identified with Greg Dixon and IBT and all that stuff, do you? And I said, well, you don't want to be a 501c3 and, and be identified with Planned Parenthood, do you? Or a witch's coven, do you? That went over good. I was just being real. I was asking that question. Because if you ask me, yes, I would have rather been identified with him than to be identified with them. Because they stood for something. The imperial commissioners might be expected decided in favor of the Catholics. The separatists, nevertheless, persisted in their view, but their appeal to the emperor continued unsuccessful. They never should have appealed to him. Those ma the church matters are too high and lofty for any government. You know what I want from the United States government? To leave me alone. Leave the church alone. More stringent civil laws were now enacted against them, banishing the Donatist clergy from their country, imposing fines on the laity, and confiscating the churches. By the way, what happened to IBT? Same thing. Brother Bush. You know, Brother Bush? The decider? I'm the decider. The decider sent in Ashcroft. Right? Is that his name, Ashcroft, or was it the other guy? I think it was him. I don't know, one of those devils. And they kicked the doors into the building, pulled out Greg Dixon on a, because Greg Dixon wouldn't get out, so they had to put him on a, I think they put him on a, yeah, a stretcher and carried him out, because he wouldn't leave. And he made him do that. He made them do that to him. And he told me he told me the stories about him sitting in a federal prison. I forget the story he told me. I was sitting in his apartment back in 2012. Man, I wish I could remember that story. I was sitting in his apartment talking to him in 2012 or 2011. 2011. I was sitting in his apartment at that at IBT's new building that they had or whatever the meeting house had. And I was sitting there talking. He was telling me stories about what happened when he was in prison that day. And I can't or those three days. That he was in prison. I just I can't remember what he said, but anyway, it was funny. I hope I remember it sometime. But anyway, it was it was funny just what he went through in federal prison. It was it was he they sat in there and they and I forget what happened, but it was it was kind of funny what he did. But the guy had been through a lot. You know, and he's and that was under, by the way, a Christian brother Bush. Brother Bush. Yeah, and, and supposed to be a Christian attorney general. Right? Okay, in 415, in 415, they were forbidden to hold religious assemblies upon pain of death. 
Augustine himself, who had previously consented only to spiritual measures against heretics, wink, wink, I, I'm sorry, but I do not believe that. If you believe that, you have rocks in your head. Because I do not believe that at all. Not even a little bit do I believe that at all. When you have the deck stacked against you like that, no way. Now advoc Oh, here we go. Yeah, so I was right. Look. Spiritual measures against the heretics now advocated force to bring them into the fellowship of the church. Out of which there was no salvation. We must save you, stupid peasants. You stupid heretics. So by force we'll bring you in. Sounds like Calvin in Geneva a little bit, doesn't it? Oh, wait, that's where he got it. And where did Calvin get it? From Augustine. Where did Augustine get it? Well, probably Constantine. Because Constantine was the first one to do it. We just want to love you with the truth. Come on, we love you. Come on in. He now advocated force. We got to drop some of that salvation on them boys. <laughs> right? He looked at the daughter and he's like, we're going to drop some salvation on you guys. Look, you need some, you need some redemption. Don't you know there's no salvation outside of the Catholic Church? Do you see what they were teaching? Was it, would that be Augustine's city of God? That, that might be. I hope I make some people mad with that. I really do. What's that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's right. Okay. He appealed, here he is, he appealed to the command in the parable of the supper to compel them to come in. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, I'm too tired to read this. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, li literally, he looked at the command to compel them to come in by force. <laughs> Like, does anyone get out of there that Jesus took the sword out and was like, shh, compel them to come in? Yeah, it's time for the wedding. Whoosh, you know, <laughs> right? That's what, that's what Constant or not Constantine, sorry, Augustine, one of those Steens, one of those guys. He appealed, yeah, he appealed to the command in the parable of the supper to compel them to come in. Where, however, the compel is evidently but a vivid hyperbole. <laughs> for the holy zeal in the conversion of the heathen, which we find, for example, in the Apostle Paul. New eruptions of fanaticism ensued. Wait, so Augustine's not the fanatic because he's taking the sword out and wanting to round them all up and get them in the Catholic Church and force him. But it's those Donatists. Those crazy, fanatical, I mean, imagine that. They just want you all to leave them alone and have their own churches and preach the word of God and have their bishops and ordain their own elders and you not come in and rob them of their buildings or their meeting houses and rob them of their livelihood and everything else. That's What's wrong with those fanatics anyway? But, yeah, yeah, it's your fault I'm stabbing you. Stop it. Stop making me do this to you. Right? New eruptions of fanaticism ensued. Those nuts. A bishop, Gontentius, threatened that if the attempt were made to deprive him of his church by force, he would burn himself with his congregation in it and vindicated this intended, this intended suicide by the example of Rosas in the second book of Maccabees. Do I know if that's true or not? Nope. Nope. They wanted to die. Just like all those people in Waco, they wanted to die, didn't they? They just, you know, those people went in there in that building and they, they just wanted to burn themselves up. That's, they wanted to start the fire when that, you know, when they fired into those people and they started that on fire. They, they were asking for that. They, they really wanted to burn up in a fire like that. That's really what they wanted to do. Yeah, I mean, right? They, they wanted to do that, right? They, they wanted that democracy dropped on them. They, they really wanted that. I mean, you know, they were crazy. They, they felt that way. 
The conquest of Africa by the Aryan Vandals in 428 devastated the African church and put an end to this controversy as the French Revolution swept both Jesuitism and Jansenism away. Yet a remnant of the Donatists, as we learn from the letters of Gregory, the first perpetuated itself into the 7th century, still proving in their ruins the power of a mistaken Puritanic zeal. They were just mistaken. Purit Does anybody think what they did so far, I mean, what they, that doesn't sound mistaken. It sounds biblical. Now, I'm, I'm definitely not going to say that they were perfect because none of us are either. And the responsibility and guilt of, a sta of state church persecution. Well, he's right about that. Schaff told the truth about that. In the 7th century, the entire African church sank under the Saracenic conquest. The Donatist controversy was a conflict between separatism and Catholicism. Ooh, how much more we got here? Oh, man. Oh, just enough. Yep, not too bad. We'll finish this up here. Between ecclesiastical purism and ecclesiastical ecclesia electicism. Between the idea of the church as an exclusive community of regenerate saints and the idea of the church as the general Christendom of, sta of state and people. So which do you believe? Is the church an exclusive community of regenerate saints? Or is it general Christendom of state and people? Right. See the difference? So their view of the, chur uh, of the church, of ecclesiastical, it is like this big, huge state of lost people and saved people, all just a part of that. Well, what, what, what do the Donatists contend for? What they found in the New Testament? Like they, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't see it as that. They didn't see it as nation or kingdom building. Yeah, it has been. It revolved around the doctrine of the essence of the Christian church, and in particular, of the predicate of holiness. It resulted in the completion by Augustine of the Catholic dogma of the church, which had been partly developed by Cyprian in his conflict with a similar schism. The Donatists, like Tertullian in his Mon Mon Monsonistic writings, started from an ideal and spiritualistic conception of the church as a fellowship of saints, which in a sinful world could only be imperfectly realized. Did you catch that? They laid chief stress on the predicate of the subjective holiness or personal worthiness of the several members and made the catholicity, catholicity of the church and the efficacy of the sacraments dependent upon that. No, what they said was is no one gets the ordinances and nobody, it, the ordinances will not be administered to a bunch of people that don't, that live like hell. That we're not going to invite lost people into our church to partake of, uh, baptize them and have them part of a, a church state. No, you're either part of that local New Testament church, a called out assembly of believers, like we talked about in, in the Baptist distinctives. You're either part of that, the Donatist said, or you're not, because we don't agree with anything else. But Augustine wanted the big tent. Right? The true church, therefore, is not so much a school of holiness as a society of those who are already holy, or at least of those who appear so, for that there are hypocrites not even the Donatists could deny, and as little could they in earnest claim infallibility in their own discernment of men. Well, I don't think they were trying to do that. I think they were trying to follow the scriptures. I don't think they were looking for perfect people. There's a difference in looking for a perfect saint or somebody that has to be perfect and somebody that trades in their brothers and sisters, turns in uh, the scriptures, and that, that, that a church that believes in lacks discipline. By the toleration of those who are openly sinful, the church loses her holiness and ceases to be church. Well, didn't Jesus say that if they did not repent, he would do what? Take their candlestick. He would remove their candlestick from them if they did not repent. 
Unholy priests are incapable of administering sacraments. For how can regeneration proceed from the unregenerate, holiness from the unholy? No one can give what he does not himself possess. He would receive faith from a faithless, who would receive faith from a faithless man, receive not faith but guilt. So what were they saying? No, they, they meant that their, that their bishops had to, qual- they had, to, they had to follow the qualifications of the, of, the, of the scriptures. Their churches had to follow the qualifications of those. They, they believe that wicked men should not be ordaining. Men of the baser sort should not be laying hands on people, should not be administering the ordinances, and should not hold an office. It was on this ground, in fact, that they rejected the election of Sicilian, that he had been ordained bishop by an unworthy person on this ground. They refused to recognize the Catholic baptism as baptism at all. Well, I, I do that too. Don't we do that? Don't you refuse it? On this point, they had some support in Cyprian, who likewise rejected the validity of heretical baptism, though not from the separatists, but from the Catholic point of view, and who came into collision upon this question with Stephen of Rome. So, basically, others believe that, too, that if you told me that, well, I was baptized by immersion, by, by, by some female preacher in a Baptist church, what would you say to that? That's not baptism, right? You would say the same thing, right? And if you, if you told me that you were baptized by somebody who was a known heretic, right, then we wouldn't accept that if their church was heretical. Why? Well, why are you leaving it? Are you leaving it because you want to identify with it or you don't want to identify with it? Right? Hence, likewise, the Montanists and Novationists, they insisted on rigorous church discipline and demanded the, ex- demanded the excommunication of all unworthy members, especially of such as had denied their faith or given up the Holy Scriptures under persecution. They resisted, moreover, all interference of the civil power in church affairs. I do too. Don't you? I'm not waiting for for our governor to tell me when it's okay to meet as a church. Or 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 for them to tell us what a church is, or for them to define a church, or for them to give me paperwork that says, "Well, now you're allowed to be a church." Well, now you're allowed to be a church cuz you have our permission. Right? There's a place for you to protest down there. Right? We're not waiting for that, are we? So don't we identify with them too, in that sense? Yeah, or you can have 50% occupancy. I think, I, I th- are we supposed to be doing that? I mean, I preach for like an hour and a half, hour, hour and a half sometimes. Those girls would have turned blue in the face, all these girls. They had to wear a mask that long. They wouldn't be able to breathe. That's true. Yeah, I don't have one of those cool signs like they all have. When you walk in, know that one sign you walk in and they're showing, put this on, it's the law, loser. I don't have one of those. I don't know. I didn't, nobody sent me one. Look, we're healthier than the health department. Have you seen what those people produce? (laughs) Sick people. Okay, here we go. In the great, let me back up, sorry. They resisted, moreover, all interference of the civil power in church affairs, though they themselves at first had solicited the help of Constantine. That was a mistake that they regretted. In the great imperial church, (laughs) and... In the great imperial church, embracing the people in a mass, they saw a secularized Babylon against which they set themselves off in separatistic arrogance. Shame on them. And the only true and pure church. 
In support of their views, they appeal to the passages of the Old Testament which speak of the external holiness of the people of God and to the procedure of Paul with respect to the fornicator at Corinth. You mean they, they actually appeal to Scripture? In opposition to this subjective and spiritualistic theory of the church, Augustine, a champion of the Catholics, developed the objective realistic theory. <laughs> okay, what's the objective realistic theory? Which has since been repeatedly reasserted. Though this, though with various moderate modifications, not only in the Roman Church but also in the Protestant, against separatistic and schismatic sects. What's that mean? Against you, losers! You dumb ham and eggers! You. Who do you think you are speaking against Constantine and Augustine and every other Steen? What's the matter with you guys? He lays chief stress on the Catholicity of the Church and derives the holiness of individual members and the validity of ecclesiastical functions from it. He finds the essence of the church not in personal character of the several Christian, but in the union of the whole church with Christ. Really? So basically, lacks church discipline, if any at all. All one big tent and all big happy family. Take, what's that? Right, exactly. Taking the historical point of view, he goes back to the founding of the church, which may be seen in the New Testament, which is spread over all the world and which is connected through the unbroken succession of bishops with the apostles and with Christ. Did you catch that? He's Catholic. So what did he just tell you? Yeah, the apostolic succession. See, the Catholics were allowed to call themselves the true church, but, but you guys aren't allowed to call yourself a true and pure church. But the Catholics are allowed to do that, aren't they? See how that works? You see how he just did that? If you follow it, that's exactly what they're doing. This is fun. I like this. I'm having a lot of fun with this. I know you're all tired, but I'm not. Now I'm getting my second wind. Or maybe it was that bang. I don't know. But anyway. <laughs> yeah. That's it. This alone can be the true church. It is impossible that she should all at once disappear from the earth or should exist only in the African sect of the Donatist. First of all, they never said that it disappeared. Second of all, um, yeah, you know what? The churches were protected in the valleys of Piedmont. Right? For hundreds of years. Actually, thousands. A thousand. At least. Mm hmm. Right. Right, because they were they were they were starting churches all over the place. But God has used sects of people of churches to start churches like that. You're gonna find when we get through all these other names, someday you're all gonna be like forty or fifty, some of you young kids, but once we finally get through these different groups, Luke's gonna be like forty, yeah, by the time we get there. But anyway, that's what's gonna happen. But you, when you get to them, you'll see that God used those specific groups. And they would start more churches. That's what they would do. This alone could be the true church. Okay, let me back up. This even, what, what, is all, what is all that they may say of their little heap in comparison with the great Catholic Christendom of all lands? What about your little heap you have? You see the absolute arrogance that's, that's when you start treating people like that. That's how you can kill them so easy. Your little heap. Thus, even numerical preponderance here enters as an argument. 
though under other circumstances it may prove too much and would place the primitive church at a clear disadvantage in comparison with the prevailing Jewish and heathen masses and the evangelical church in its controversy with the Roman Catholics. Wait, so you're saying bigger's not always better and more's not always right? Oh, you, you're actually saying that? White man speak with forked tongue. Right? Did you catch that? Because that's what he did. From the objective character of the church as a divine institution flows, according to the Catholic view, the efficacy of all her foundations, the sacraments in particular. When Pertillian at the Collatio Cum Donatus said, he who receives the faith from a faithless priest receives not faith but guilt. Augustine answered, but Christ is not unfaithful from whom I receive faith, not guilt. Christ, therefore, is properly the functionary and the priest is simply his organ. My origin, said Augustine, on the same occasion is Christ. My root is Christ. My head is Christ. The seed of which I was born is the word of God, which I must obey, even though the preacher himself practice not what he preaches. I believe not in the minister by whom I am baptized, but in Christ, who alone justifies the sinner and can forgive guilt. I agree with what Augustine said there. But here's the problem. God, God uses people. And God laid down the foundation of the church. And he laid down the discipline and the order that it was supposed to have. And what he's trying to do is use an argument that says, well, basically, it doesn't matter what church you go to. It doesn't matter what your bishop's like. It doesn't matter any of that. All that matters is that you have faith in Christ. Now, for your never-dying soul, that is all that matters. Your salvation is not tied up in that bishop. But if you're speaking of the faith as far as once delivered unto the saints that I'm supposed to live out and follow in my life, then what that is saying is it doesn't matter who your pastor is or how he lives or what he does or what your church does. Because that's what he's saying. That's what he's teaching. And that's wrong. Lastly, in regard to church discipline, the opponents of the Donatists agreed with them in considering it wholesome and necessary, but would keep it within the limits fixed for it by the circumstances of time and the fallibility of men. So you mean not the scriptures? A perfect separation of sinners from saints is impractical impracticable before the final judgment. Well, I don't think anybody said any different. Many things must be patiently borne that greater evil may be averted. What does that mean exactly? And that those still capable of improvement may be improved, especially where the offender has too many adherents. Man, says Augustine, should punish in the spirit of love until either the discipline and correction come from above or the tares are pulled up by the universal harvest. Wait a minute, but that's not what you said. You said, I'm going to compel them to come in. Wait, so you get to compel them to come in by force, but they're not allowed to have church discipline in their churches and excommunicate who that church decides. So whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Wait, they don't get to make those decisions? It's you? Some big smarty pants somewhere gets to make that decision for them? See how it works? In support of this view, appeal was made to the Lord's parables of the tares among the wheat and of the net which gathered together every kind. These two parables were the chief exegetical battleground of the two parties. The Donatists understood by the field, not the church, but the world according to the Savior's own exposition of the parables of the tares. Yeah. Because what was the field? It was the world. Not the church. How much persecution has taken place because that's been viewed in the opposite? The Catholics replied that it was the kingdom of heaven or the church to which the parable referred as a whole and pressed especially by the warning of the Savior not to gather up the tares before the final harvest, lest they root up also the wheat with them. The Donatists, however, moreover, made a distinction between unknown offenders to whom alone the parable of the net referred and notorious sinners. So do you think the doctrine of the Catholics still holds true today as they protect all the child molesters and all the pedophiles and in their secret, mysterious Babylonian worship that they do, that that doctrine still holds there today? And that's why they do all that? 
But this did not gain them much, for if the church compromises her character for holiness by contact with unworthy persons at all, it matters not whether they be openly unworthy before men or not, and no church whatever would be left on earth. It's not true. If there's known offenders in this church, if they knowingly sin against God and live a vile life, we, any one of us are to be disciplined for that. And if we don't repent, we're to be cast out. Amen. That's the truth. That's what Paul said. On the other hand, however, Augustine, who no more than the Donatists could relinquish the predicate of holiness for the church, found himself compelled to distinguish between a true and a mixed or merely apparent body of Christ. For as much as hypocrites, even in this world, are not in with Christ, are not are not in and with Christ, but only appear to be. And yet he repelled the Donatist charge of making two churches. In his view, it is one and the same church, which is now mixed with the ungodly and will hereafter be pure, as it is the same Christ who once died and now lives forever, and the same believers who are now mortal will only will one day put on immortality. With some modifications, we may find here the germ of the subsequent Protestant distinction of the visible and invisible church. We just believe in literal, visible church. Amen. We worry about the discipline of the one that's right in front of us that we're in, not some invisible one. Which regards the invisible as not as another church, but as the ecclesia, as a smaller communion of true believers among professors, and thus at the true substance of the visible church, and as contained within its limits, like the soul in the body or the kernel in the shell. Here the moderate Donatist and scholarly theologian Tychonus approached Augustine, calling the church a twofold body of Christ, which the one part embraces, the true Christians, and the other the apparent. In this, as also it acknowledged the validity of the Catholic baptism, Tychonius departed from the Donatists. While he, had, while he adhered to their views on discipline and opposed the Catholic mixture of the church and the world. But neither he nor Augustine pursued this distinction to any clearer development. Both were involved at the bottom of the confusion of Christianity with the church and of the church with the particular outward organization. So what did the Donatists contend for? And we're, we, we won't uh, continue, continue on with that, okay? Um, but um, we'll stop there today. But because we're going to we'll get into the history of the Donatists over here. But that gives you Schaff's view, which he tells a compelling story. I mean, I don't agree with everything he said, obviously, but he tells a compelling story about what happened. He explains it and he gets into some specifics for us so we can kind of understand. We're not always going to agree with with um, with that man. OK, but but we can understand it. All right. Let's see here. OK. I'm giving you some turn to first Corinthians chapter five as we close out here. So the, the, the idea of the church is what was different here. OK. They believed in a literal, visible assembly of believers that they, had a, that they should have a discipline over. They believed in more of a universal, invisible church state of people coming in and going as they please pretty much and as them being just part of that church, which mixed it with the state and everything else. The field, the Donatists viewed it as the field was the world, as what Christ said. What did they view it as? The church. They still do. And that's why they're, that is, that is why they do what they do. So, here's going to be 1 Corinthians chapter 5. You have two weeks. Give me some time here because I won't be here next Sunday. So, we'll give you two weeks here. 1 through 7. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. And such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For verily, for I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present concerning him that hath done so so done this deed in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you're gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one, such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump purge out therefore the old leaven that you may be a new lump as ye are as ye are unleavened for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Now, 
For you that want to do the, that, that can do the older ones, you can do the whole chapter. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters. For then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I've written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or extortioner, with such a one, know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So you have two weeks. Little ones, you have a minimum of, we'll say three verses. If you're really small, we'll make an exception. Older ones, you should get at least seven of them. You adventurous ones should get all 13 of them. Right? You have two weeks, right? You'll do it. I know it. Amen? But, but anyway, what is this? This is church discipline. This is what the Donatists, this is what they based their church discipline on as far as one of the things they based their church discipline on. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Now, where'd they make their mistake? I want to teach you something here. 1 Corinthians 6. Go there real quick. This is where they made their mistake. I never should have done this. Dare any of you having a matter against another go to the law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who, it, who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brother, but brother go to, go to, goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers? Now, therefore, this is utterly a fault among you, because you go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, you do wrong and defraud in that your brethren. You know, this is a serious charge. Paul is telling them, you, you had no business going to the world. Right? I like Joshua read from an old Baptist book from the 1880s, and it was, what was the name of that man that wrote on church discipline? You read it a week ago. Well, he wrote on about not about the church business being the church business. He was back when the Southern Baptists were good. <laughs> when they had their strong church doctrine. Was it, I forget what, do you remember who it was? He wrote, he wrote on it, it was really good, but you, you, you sent it in the chat. And anyway, he talked about that, how he w if, if, if he was voted out or whatever, if something happened, that he wouldn't go to the world and make that argument. He would move on to another church. He would go to do what? Yeah. I don't know if I'd agree with that, but that was a strong belief. But they were very strong. But that's like the Donatists. I don't agree with everything they said either from that. You know what I mean? Um, but the point is, they he believed that the church, that that ruling was final with that church. And that's just the way it is. You just move on and you just go about your business and... Now, that doesn't mean you couldn't go to another church and say, look, this is what happened at my church. You can contact the pastor. They don't want me back. This is what's going to happen. This is the way it's, it's going to be. And I'm, I'm seeking membership here, and I want to serve the Lord and live faithful to God and do this. And, and maybe that pastor would contact uh, uh, us or something, and they would say, you know, we would have that discussion about that. Right? So anyway, but to go to the world like that, though, do you see how God condemns that? By the way, this is before the Internet. How much, the, how much more so now that we see that, right? 
We know. We've watched the videos and seen all that stuff and all the, all that kind of stuff. Amen. I know it gets me kind of excited because the church still rolls on. I'm still here doing what God called me to do. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Still, still doing what God called me to do after all of it. That's God's preservation. I can't be proud of it. God's put me through a lot of things. But I'll tell you this, I can sure be happy with the Lord over it. I can sure praise the Lord over it, can I? I can sure say Satan didn't win. God's still up there on the throne, and I'm still preaching. And this church is still thriving by the grace of Almighty God. Amen. More blessed than we deserve. Amen. All right. Let's see here. All right. Let's see. Need to have somebody pray now. Let's, Brother Aaron, why don't you pray for us? Now you got to yell loud, Brother Aaron, so they can hear you. Yeah, use that big voice of yours, all right? Pray for us. Ask the Lord to bless us and dismiss us with his uh, blessing and thank the Lord for everything. Amen. All right. Just a reminder, I'll be here on Wednesday, um, and I'll, I'll be preaching Wednesday and everything, and then we'll take off at the end of the week. I'll be gone. Uh, so Grandpa will be bringing the kids, and obviously Hannah will be home for a while, but um, if I can keep her down there, but uh, <laughs> but she, she'll be home, and then, and then but uh, yeah, we'll be gone. So next Sunday, I think Brother Andrew is going to be preaching then prayer meeting in the afternoon. Uh, hymns, prayer meeting, testimonies in the afternoon there next Sunday. And uh, still looking for places to preach, guys, so we'll, we'll still keep working on it. We're hoping some of this changes pretty soon, you know, but <laughs> it's pretty crazy out there right now. But anyway, so you keep praying for my family. Pray for little baby and Hannah and all the recovery and all that good stuff and for my family and and uh, for one another, Amen. Pray for one another. Pray for we got people moving this week and going through all kinds of stuff. You keep praying for Joy. She's excited. Joy wants to get here and she's still planning on it. So every once in a while, and Jessica stays in close contact with her. And every once in a while, she she's texting me and Hannah, letting us know what how things are going. And she's excited and still wants to get here. And so you keep praying for her. And um, your friend is coming. He's still coming, right? Uh, the last time I heard, he's flying out here. Yeah, the 11th through the 15th. He's, he's coming for Valentine's Day, I guess. So, <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, no, he's, uh, but you pray for him. He, we're, we're going to talk about some things. So, um, and that's a step of faith for him to even do that, right? So, amen. Yeah. Yeah, he's got, he's kind of got, are we off there? Get, uh, yeah, well, because YouTube, I don't want this on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs>